but I'll tell you what it might be. Um, and that is, how many of you have heard of the uh, Global Economic Eight? The G8, how many of you heard of that? They now have G7 because the bad boy Russia has been removed. You probably remember that, okay? So then you have the G20. How many of you, remember, how many of you heard that, okay? That's, that includes some of the other emerging nations like Brazil and India and, and uh, Argentina and Chile and, and uh, Indonesia and other emerging nations that want a seat at the table, so to speak. And they make all the big economic decisions for the world. And Davos in Switzerland is sort of an extension of that where world leaders come to that and, and discuss, you know, economic ideals. And of course, most of the business is done behind closed doors and not in their open speeches up front, and everybody knows that. Um, but nevertheless, it's, uh, it's always an interesting time to watch because occasionally a world leader will blow up at another world leader like, uh, like, um, uh, Erdogan of Turkey when he blew up at uh, the Israeli um, Prime Minister Netanyahu on stage and uh, walked off the stage in, in, a, in, a, in a torrent of cursing words and uh, that was theater for everybody on the, the news networks. That, that was about 10 years ago, but it was, it was fascinating to watch. Um, but there, then there's the security, UN Security Council, which is very powerful. Um, and that, you know, that could be part of that larger world body. I don't know, but it's a powerful body of world leaders and it tends to be an ad hoc body of world leaders because we're even told in early writings, page 282, Ellen White talks about the time of trouble and she, she refers to the leading men of the earth, a loose confederation, get together and sign a decree giving the people the ability to go hunt down those troublemakers of the earth, the Sabbath keepers, um, and because they're the cause of all the natural calamities throughout the earth. Fascinating reading, uh, early writings, page 282. And so the 10 kings, I don't know who they are. I have no idea. But, you know, I'm just assuming it has to be a larger world body context than just Europe. And it has to be a larger body of influence that uh, pretty much calls the shots globally today, okay? And is recognized by the international community as such, okay? So we have to, we have to bring prophecy down to our time to understand it. Um, so they ally themselves for one hour with the beast. Well, who is this beast? It says they have one purpose and that purpose seems to be, the way I understand it, under extreme difficult times in the world, economic and uh, politically, they have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. It seems that it's for the sake of world peace. And they're grasping at straws, seeking to know what to do. And we kind of find out the answer to that in Revelation 13. You see, Revelation 17, 12 to 14 is a miniature uh, big, but big picture repeat of Revelation 13 verses 11 to 15, okay? And Revelation 13 verses 11 to 15 talks about the prophetic threefold union of the rise of Protestant America, the healing of the wound with Rome, and it's joining together with America, and then that third full power, the charismatic movement, the fire that appears to come down from the throne of God it, itself, or pretends to, okay? Which is a false spirit, as we shall see in terms of the definition in the Greek of the word fire and what that actually means. So let's go there first. Revelation 13 seems to have frozen up. Help. There we go. Good. Let's hope it stays there now. Um, it says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. We have to look at Revelation 13 in two parts. I'll just summarize it real easily and quickly to make it easily accessible to your thinking and understanding. The first part of Revelation 13 talks about the rise of this sea beast coming up out of the water. The second beast described in 
the second half of Revelation 13 is a beast that comes up out of the earth. Okay? The sea representing many nations, languages, tongues, and peoples where there's lots of crowded masses and um, not much room to maneuver. That was representing Europe. Okay? And then earth representing newness where there's not very many people and it represented a new world, a new world of discovery, which in Revelation 12, you read about the serpent chasing the woman and the woman runs for her life and a flood tries to threaten her, but she washes up on the shores and she comes to this new world where she receives a refuge of religious freedom and respite, okay, from persecution. All right, that represents the new world, okay, America, all right, and so it represents the pilgrims, the Puritans, and so forth. And so you have this developing, emerging new world. The word earth is very significant because it also symbolizes something that the United States would symbolize over time, and that is the value of property. You, you know, you could not become a citizen unless you owned property. That was a huge, big value in our new country. In fact, you could not vote unless you were a landowner, correct? Okay, think about that. And there was other two other identifying characteristics, and that is, how many of you heard, ever heard of the great land rush? The Oklahoma land rush, okay, where you could go out and stake your spread and you had to defend it with your life, right? Uh, how many of you ever saw the movie Oklahoma? Um, yeah, or, or any of those movies. It sort of depicted that kind of uh, era in which people staked out their claim and that was the great, that's what America stood for, you know? Land, prosperity, the opportunity for prosperity, okay? In fact, so much so, land was so important that even white indentured servants, I mean, white workers would come over in Europe and they didn't have anything except a shirt on their back and they would sell themselves as white indentured servants to landowners and farmers, people with great spreads here in the United States. And then after putting in so many years of labor, they were given several hundred or thousands of acres to farm for themselves, okay? And therefore, make a living and so forth. So it was the great expansion of the American farmer and something that Thomas Jefferson very much valued and so did Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's father was one who believed in homesteading and he tried to homestead and clear farm a, a farm in West Virginia, then Kentucky, then um, or parts of Virginia, which would later become West Virginia, but Kentucky, then Illinois. He failed every time, and so this made Lincoln a little bit upset. So he believed more in industrialization for economic sustainment than just rural farming. So interesting factor into our country's history, and but it still highlights the whole, the, the, the symbolism of the word earth and its value in this new world. And then it says he had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. These two horns represented a new experiment in world history. An experiment that no other nation, no other nation state, no other civilization had ever really tried. And that was the constitutional separation of church and state represented by our constitution and specifically by the establishment and free exercise clause, clauses of the first amendment. And that is significant because never had a Protestant nation emerged in such a way that specifically said, we will not have a king to rule over us. We will not have a pope to rule over us. We will have a sovereign representative government, federal government, and a semi-sovereign -sov and sem and semi states to rule with it as a compromise in the Constitution itself, and um, they would, the people would be represented by their representatives in a Congress. And so the rule of law was based upon this lamb-like model. It was lamb-like in the sense that it was the fairest model ever 
witnessed and observed in world history. Okay? Lamb-like. All right? But he spoke like a dragon. So it was a paradox. This new beast coming up out of the earth would be a paradox. It would have incidences like the Trail of Tears, the forced removal of the Cherokee Nation, slavery as a whole, um, clearly a representative of appearing like a lamb but speaking like a dragon in our nation's history. Absolutely. In fact, we're still struggling with that over the issue of civil rights. And so our nation continues to have a problem with that. Um, even the doctrine of preemptive strike, which may be a practical doctrine in terms of foreign policy strategy, oftentimes is referred to the United States speaking like a dragon. I don't quite make that analogy, but it is possible that it applies. Verse 12 is, is interesting because then it says that a, a, a union starts to take place between two powers. And that union is between this second beast that comes up out of the earth, okay, with a old power. That old power meaning the, the power represented by Revelation 13 verses 1 to 10. Verse 2 where it says, and all the world wondered after the beast. Talking about the, the Holy Roman Empire and its basically basic subjugation of kings and emperors um, and where there was no separation church state but where the church controlled the state um, but it had a wound in revelation 13 verse 10 if you're following me where it says that he who takes up the sword must die by the sword indeed the church of rome had taken up the sword and therefore it must die by the sword so what was that mortal wound? What was the mortal wound? In fact, it describes the wound here. Verse 12, it says, he, that is, Protest the rise of Protestant America, he exercised all the power and authority of the first beast. In other words, he become just like the first beast on his behalf. On whose behalf? On Rome's behalf. Okay? And made the earth and its inhabitants worship the beast, the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. The first beast I've been describing to you in verses 1 through 10 makes it very clear, referring it back to the first beast of Revelation 13, 1 through 10. So whose fatal wound had been healed? Well, first of all, how did it get wounded? Well, it's very simple. It got wounded because, I'll, I'll never forget, I was reading this, um, this uh, history of the popes by a famous um, church history scholar out of Oxford University by J.N. D. Kelly, who's since passed away. We studied him a lot at uh, Baylor University at the J.M. Dawson Institute of Church State Studies for our, our, in our master's and PhD programs. And anyway, he was a famous uh, British historian. But his Oxford Dictionary of Popes, it covered every, all the history of each pope up to John Paul II. So it was actually published in 1979, and John Paul II had become Pope in 78. And it covered little short, brief biographies, no more than six or seven paragraphs, short paragraphs. So it was not that big of a book, and it was an easy, it's almost like a Bible, carrying around on the history of the popes. It's kind of handy. And, and um, I, I noticed when I was reading the history of Pope Pius VI, who was captured by General Berthier, who Napoleon, the Emperor Napoleon, had sent to go capture um, um, Pope Pius VI, where he rotted in a cell and died. But then it says at the end of his bi biographical history, it says, and the papacy went on unabated. I forget when I read that, it sort of shook my faith a little bit. And I thought, well, where's the wound? Where's the prophetic wound? If the church went on unabated, then what's the problem here? You know, what are we talking about as Adventists? Do we know what we're talking about? Then it dawned on me, of course we know what we're talking about. Okay, it went on unabated. The church went on unabated. Remember, the, the Holy See and the church 
are essentially two different entities. They're, I mean, they're the same, but the Holy See is a different branch of the church. The church survived, but the Holy See is what received the mortal wound. In other words, the Holy See that sends out its curia or ambassadors to other nations, other nation states, was withdrawn. And of course, the European ambassadors who were at the Vatican also withdrew their ambassadors. Those nations withdrew their ambassadors. So it lost its diplomatic powers, diplomatic status. That was the wound. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's the wound that had occurred. So with that wound, you have um, a church that still goes on to elect its next pope. So the College of the Cardinals met, the white smoke came out of the chimney, and emerged a pope that would style himself Pope Pius VII. In fact, he was at Napoleon's um, uh, coronation as emperor in, 1840, in 1804 in uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, the big famous one with the painting by, um, oh, what's the one at the Louvre? Um, Joseph David, I think is his name, anyway. And it's, it's the largest painting in the Louvre, if you go, go there. It's, oh, it's my favorite painting. And it's where Napoleon's holding the crown and getting ready to crown Josephine as queen, while he himself has a wreath of, um, kind of a thorn, kind of a wreath type thing, not thorns, but a wreath for emperors. And the Pope was going to put it on his head, but he snatched it out as history tells us. And as Napoleon even himself tells us in his own autobiography, um, he crowned himself in order to make a statement to Rome. Hey, you have no authority to crown me. <laughs> you, you have no diplomatic status. You're not even a political power anymore. You're just a church. So I will crown myself. Okay? So that's what he did. And also to send a signal to the church that, hey, I've stripped your diplomatic powers away. You aren't going to call the shots and tell me as the emperor what to do. All right, I'm independent of you, the church. So that was interesting. But that fatal wound had been healed. And that healing occurred later when, in 1929, when Mussolini had a pact with the Vatican called the Lateran Treaty. And there, all the Vatican City states were restored and the, the Holy See and the Vatican received its diplomatic status back, was recognized by such very slowly by other European nations where they had an exchange of ambassadors. And by the time you got to Pope John Paul II, as New York Times article pointed out, from the time of the beginning of Pope John Paul II's pontificate, and it's also was in Economist magazine, um, there were 39 ambassadorships from other countries to the Vatican. By the time he finished, there were 187, okay? The diplomatic influence just in, in 20, 28 years was amazing in terms of its world influence. The Vatican through the Holy See um, clearly had its wound healed. There are other evidences of a wound being healed in the Catholic Church based upon Vatican II. Vatican II liberalized the church somewhat in order to make it appear more Protestant, more evangelical, more charismatic, more Pentecostal, and so forth. And so that's been the result of Vatican II. And then, of course, the other big piece of evidence is for the first time in the history of the United States, represented by the lamb-like beast here of verse 11, is that for the first time, we um, appointed a permanent ambassador to the Vatican, representing the United States, permanent. We've had temporary ambassadors since George Washington all the way up to the time of Ronald Reagan in 1984, where he appointed for the first time a permanent ambassador to the Vatican, okay? All right, so fatal wound had been healed. Interesting. Well, there seems to be this collusion of powers. He exercised, that is, Protestant America, we end up exercising all the power and authority of the first beast. Okay, um, Charles Krauthammer of Fox News um, put together an article, it was right during the time when um, 
we had invaded Iraq and Af Afghanistan, and he said, never before has the might of one nation uh, been seen than by the United States ever in the history of the world. And he said, it's like the ancient Roman Empire, the Rome of the Caesars, and the Holy Roman Empire all rolled up into one in terms of its power and influence around the world, in terms of how many military bases we have in all the countries, in terms of our ambassadorships, in terms of our power and influence was significant. That has eroded significantly in the last couple of years. Um, we'll see uh, what happens in the future, but I can guarantee you this one thing, that there seems to be a glitch, a blip, so to speak, on the screen right now. And more and more, Revelation 17 and Revelation, especially the 10 Kings, it unites with this beast, this threefold union, okay, that we're describing here in Revelation 13. That beast in Revelation 17 is this threefold union. Well, it seems that the trend in the future prophetically is a unilateral one. I mean, not a unilateral, but a uh, multilateral one. Uh, right now, we seem to be on a unilateral course, taking our own way and doing our own thing, despite what the rest of the world thinks. And, and we sort of had that issue even under the Bush presidency, but not so much. I mean, it, it, he was very cooperative with other world powers and you know, worked very much in, in a line with, with other entities. But in the future, it has to be a paradigm or a model of multilateralism, where a bunch of nations come together with the United States and Rome to sue for peace in the world. They follow their leadership. They follow their guidance. And I find that to be fascinating, prophetically. It has to be a multilateral model, not a unilateral model, in which the United States makes the rest of the world angry. It doesn't work that way. So that's why I think this period in history is short-lived, is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, if you're following. Verse 13 takes us to the third fold part of the union, which is the most important part. If we don't understand this part, we don't understand the rest of the talk, okay? The third part of the threefold union is this charismatic element, okay? And that charismatic element comes out of both evangelical Protestantism, where Pentecostalism got its start, and Vatican II and the Catholic Church, okay? And and then that third fold union almost takes on an identity all of itself. It says he now, it's a threefold union. He prefer this two, two, four, two fold union does the following that creates a threefold union. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. It's as if the approval of God itself, or God itself, God himself has come down to the earth to approve of this union between Protestant America and Rome. Protestant America being the sole superpower left on the planet, on the globe, and Rome, who has attached itself, just like a whore does to a beast. You see that depicted in Revelation 17. A whore right in the back of the beast. Okay, you following? All right, I hope I'm helping you understand this like you've never understood it before, because I've rehearsed this over my mind since I was a child, and I find this utterly fascinating, and that's why I've been so fascinated with foreign policy and uh, church-state constitutional history uh, here in the United States all my life. So this fire from the Greek is, is the word pur, P-U-R, or pura, okay? Um, it's used several times throughout the New Testament. Its counterpart is nur, N-U-R, in the Old Testament. Its, um, its equivalent is in the, um, the contest over the, the, um, the true God versus the God of Baal, Baal worship, when uh, Elijah was summoned to Mount Carmel for that great contest and the Ahab and Jezebel's priests, you know, cut themselves up and anyway. And then Elijah's God, you know, consumes the fire and all the priests and all the nonsense and all the stupidity and proves that he's God. Well, 
That was on Mount Carmel. That fire was Ner. Well, this fire is pura or pure. You can look it up in the Vines uh, Expository Dictionary. It says it's no ordinary fire where you warm up your hands over fire, but it is a supernatural fire that seems to come from heaven itself. And you find this word pur or pura in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the day of Pentecost in the upper room, where they received cloven tongues of fire that rested on the men and women in the upper room, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, a true outpouring of the Spirit, okay? Here, that same word demonstrate that it's a counterfeit spirit because it says that in verse 14, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It's a deceptive fire. It's a deceptive spirit that takes the world by storm. What is that deceptive spirit? Well, I, I, I want to first say that, you know, when you, when you think of um, um, this fire, it has to be uh, a identifiable source. And who represents um, all the religions of the world? It's the interfaith movement. It, it, it's a third, the reason why it's a third-fold third fold movement third part of the union, threefold union, is because it brings all the other religious influences together for a common cause, to sue for world peace. It becomes very powerful, okay? So powerful that it pretends to come from the throne of God itself, as if this must be God's will. I would say it could be akin to somebody announcing that we are now experiencing a third great awakening. Be careful of the next great awakening that supposedly occurs in this country. Now, it may be true at first, but a false spirit could take hold of it really quickly. So just be careful of that because there's already been announcements by George W. Bush that a, great, a third great awakening has started to occur. That happened in his second term while president. And then Donald Trump has announced the same thing just recently. And I thought that was interesting as well. Um, but it says, because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, on behalf of Rome, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It's a deceptive power, okay? It's not the truth. It puts forward a counterfeit Jesus. Now, how do we know that? Well, the word fire has a, has a twofold meaning here. You see, and, I, and I've run this by some of our biblical scholars, and, and um, including by the E.G. White Estate and, and other people. But it seems that what we have here is a counterfeit Christ. In other words, this fire is also represented as a counterfeit Messiah. In other words, a counterfeit Messiah comes as an angel of light. Now, how do we know that? Well, the word fire, the synonym for it, there's all kinds of synonyms, but the one that sticks out the most is the word light. Fire and light. You ever, you ever grow up listening to a rock song called Fire and Light? Um, well, I did. Anyway, the point is, is that fire and light are very significant here. I'll never forget doing evangelism in New York City for three years. Anytime we would go up to the Atlantic Union Conference or to uh, the Southern New England Conference for pastoral meetings, me and Tony Moore would go up there and, and uh, um, we'd be driving back at night. And this one night, there was no moon out, no nothing. And it was even cloudy that night. And it looked so dark going back down on... on on, I think it's Interstate 95. Man, my memory is not jogging me right. I think it's 95. Anyway, so we were going down south, back to New York City. And Tony says, oh, well, I have no problem getting lost. He says, you could crawl out in the bush from Hill and Dale all the way back to New York City because just look south, just look. We got out of the car and we looked. Sure enough, you could see this big glow to the south, this huge glow. The Big Apple was shining, okay? New York City was shining down there. It was like lit up, okay, up against the clouds. So you could see, you know, you would eventually find your way back to the Big Apple, right? Well, it kind of reminds me of that. Um, when you see a fire off in the distance at night, what's the first thing you see? It's not smoke. It's light is the primary thing you see. 
So fire and light. Well, there's a text in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, and it's verse 14. Paul talks about uh, false apostles uh, coming and invading the churches. And then in verse 14, he says, And no wonder, for Satan himself comes as a, appears as a what? As an angel of light. That's fascinating to me. So there we have in that verse, right there, an attempt by Satan to impersonate Jesus Christ himself. It's the grand, final, ultimate um, deception upon the world. And of course, um, those, those who are awake will be awake, and those who are deceived will be deceived. But this threefold union ends up putting forth a death decree. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak, cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. The image, what is the image of the beast? People have often wondered, what is the image of the beast? Great Controversy, page 443, and um, I find this statement to be interesting because a lot of people reject it um, and don't like it. They never, in fact, it's the least um, favorite passage in the Spirit of Prophecy because it tends to go against our political prejudices. But it's Great Controversy, page 443. It says the following. It says, in order for the United States, for our country to, and here's, she's very specific, Ellen G. White is very specific here, in order for the United States to form an image of the beast. And who is the beast? Rome. Okay. What did Rome do? It had a church-state paradigm or church-state model in which um, the church manipulated, dominated, and controlled kings and emperors. Okay. For nearly 1,260 years. All right. Listen to this. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power or powers, power is plural here, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish your own ends. It doesn't say socialism. It doesn't say in order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the socialist power must so control the civil government. It doesn't say the secular humanist power must so control the civil government. It doesn't say the atheists must so control the civil government, does it? It doesn't say that, does it? Isn't that interesting? I find that fascinating. I think many of us are mis misled by our Cold War era uh, philosophy and worldview. We need to revisit Ellen White and understand it for what it really is. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends, her own apocalyptic ends, her own uh, um, eschatological ends, which if you follow their understanding, whether it's Tim LaHaye, Hal Lindsey, you know, late great planet Earth, uh, the, you know, they've got to take out the Antichrist and the whole secret rapture is involved and... You know, it's just, anyway, so this runs completely counter to that, and that's what motivates a lot of political entities today is their eschatology that drives them for their support of Israel and, and or even the Palestinians, depending on your worldview. But um, the focus seems to be always on the Middle East, but our focus prophetically really needs to be right here in the United States in terms of what's happening in terms of the world and Rome. So, the image to the beast, he was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast. So, the image is what? The image is formed. What is that image? It's the church controlling the state, all right? And in this sense, it's global. In this sense, it's not only the United States and Rome with this third-fold union that forms the, the, the ten kings uniting with that beast that I've just described. But it's the whole world coming together, okay? It's the, it's the third fold union, a charismatic movement that, and, and Rome, working with Rome and the United States, evangelical Protestants, that causes the world to unite in one cause. Where Ellen White in her vision, vision in early writings, page 282, the leading men of the earth come together to issue and sign decree, a decree giving the people 
the, the maddening throng, the populace unthinking multitude, the mob, okay? The fickle will of we the people, the unthinking will of the people to go forward to kill those who refuse to follow the plan outlined by world leaders for world peace. And what is that that gets in the way? Is it just the Sabbath? Or is it because we refuse to stop evangelizing because we are true to our mission? We are true to the liberty of conscience that God has given us to, to share the good news with others so that they can be waiting and ready at Christ's second coming. Amen? That's what we'll be persecuted for, my friends. With the doctrine of peaceful coexistence, as we shall look upon here, the second half of our talk, you'll see what I'm talking about. Because that's where the world is trending. The Duma, the Russian Duma passed a law just, um, it was uh, three years ago, I believe it was, passed a law that no more proselytization by anybody, okay? No more evangelization. And um, the Jehovah's Witnesses were just banned. Now, the rumor that Adventists were banned from Russia is not true. That's, that's not true. We actually have very good relations with the Russian Orthodox Church there. And um, so, in fact, Seventh-day Adventists are very, much, very well liked by Orthodox, including in Romania. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the, I learned this at Baylor University. A uh, Baptist uh, preacher became a Greek Orthodox priest. And he was one of my classmates, and he says, do you realize that the Greek Orthodox very much believes in the Seventh-day Sabbath? Do you realize that we don't believe Sunday is the true Sabbath? We believe the Catholics have that wrong. We actually hold the uh, Saturday Sabbath as the, from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown as our Sabbath. Um, but the masses prefer that, you know, things are done on Sunday. But other than that, well, our holy day is the Sabbath from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. I think, I think there's a lot for the Seventh-day Adventist Church to tap into in terms of the Orthodox uh, faiths out there in Eastern Europe and around the world. And uh, we have to uh, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves in how we approach the Orthodox community because I think their uh, potential, um, um, potential people that can be one to the message that uh, we have from Jesus. So here we have a coming together of the international community, essentially, um, to do what it thinks it has to do in order to achieve world peace. But there's a group, and there'll be other groups, not just us, that are singled out as troublers of the earth. So it's not just us. Don't think of it as just us. In fact, I remember, and one analogy to that historically is that, you know, you, in history, you always hear about the Walden Seas and how they were persecuted by the Catholic Church in the Dark Ages. But I'm often, often reminder, reminded there was the Cathars, there were the Albigenses, there were all kinds of different other groups that weren't just the Walden Seas that got persecuted. And of course, there were Protestants who got persecuted and, um, that emanated from Luther and so on. But the Walden Seas were the forerunner to the Protestant Reformation. And there were other groups that spawned off from that um, or found, you know, had their own form of opposition to the Catholic Church. So there, there are always going to be the opposition, always. There's two books out there in the academic world that are very important to know about. Um, the first uh, I'm going to cite is by um, Samuel Huntington on the left, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. He wrote an article in uh, Foreign Affairs Journal published by the Council on Foreign Relations in 1983, predicting the fall of communism in the Soviet Union. And, and in fact, the end of the Cold War, he predicted. It was a, it was a I mean, it was wildly condemned by scholars um, in Yale and Berkeley and Stanford and other famous universities who thought he was nuts. And this was Samuel Huntington and Harvard. But as they saw the Iron Curtain fall in Poland and in Eastern Europe, Europe and, and as Soviet Union fell apart, um, his book became, it actually, they demanded that he publish it as a book. And so he published it in 1996, three years later. And uh, of course, the wall and you know, Boris Yeltsin came to power in 1991 and all that. And, but by 1996, 
Um, he published this book and it became the Pulitzer Prize winning book for uh, political science, The Clash of Civilizations and the Remaking of World Order. And in this book, he said, it was like a golden thread that run throughout. He said, we must sue for world peace. And the only way we're gonna have world peace is if the Western world with its high standard for the full constitutional guarantee of religious freedom, which is mirrored by articles 18 and 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the uh, religious freedom and free speech clauses of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, articles 18 and 19. He says that unless the Western world takes a step back, instead of the full guarantee of religious freedom, takes a step back to the olden days of the Puritans and just accept the doctrine of toleration, the idea that everybody has a right to peacefully coexist, other religions, you have a right to peacefully coexist, worship on your day, worship whatever, but you don't have a right to proselytize or evangelize anyone else. He says, that's what we got to do. It's the only way we're going to have world peace because that's the Eastern world will not budge on this. He said, the Eastern world will not budge on this. And so he also said in that book that Islam, in terms of, and this is where this conspiracy theory came from, he originated it, and unfortunately it's, it's traveled like wildfire throughout the world, his argument that Islam would take over the world through birth rate, and it would do it by 2020, that it would take over the Western world, take over the world, that Sharia law would basically, you know, have to either uh, be accepted or, you know, he doesn't go that far, but he does say that it is a threat to the Western world, okay? And the next book that comes along, Philip Jenkins, who's a, um, he was a professor at Penn State University um, on the sociology of religion, but he transferred, he got a new job at Baylor University, my alma mater, and he's a, a very, very good professor there. And he's come and spoken uh, several times at Walla Walla University here, our university. And he's spoken at Pacific Union College and Andrews and elsewhere. He's, he's the, probably the world's foremost church historian in terms of understanding church history and world church history. But he wrote this book called The Next Christendom, The Coming of Global Christianity. You can't see the subtitle, but it's The Coming of Global Christianity. And he argues just the opposite. He counters, and he, and he stutters, studies statistics and growth patterns throughout the world. He says, Christianity is far outpacing the growth of Islam through birth, through evangelization, okay, through soul winning, all right? South America, Central America, booming with baptisms, booming in India, booming um, Indonesia, booming in China, okay, booming in home churches in Russia, and that's why they want to stem the effect of evangelism. They want to halt the growth of Christian evangelism. So there's this war, there's this clash of civilizations, it seems. And of course, Islam is very much the leader of this interfaith left movement throughout the world. This idea that we have, we should peacefully coexist, but not evangelize one another. Which of course, if they get there that way, then of course, Christianity loses and Islam wins. Okay? But he said, in his book, he said, wouldn't it be interesting page 208. He says, wouldn't it be interesting if the Pope became the world peacemaker once again? What, wouldn't it be interesting if the Pope intervened and became the world peacemaker accepted by all religions to sue for world peace and that world leaders would come to the Pope to make that happen? That's what Philip Jenkins says. That's Philip Jenkins, the world's leading church historian. That's pretty fascinating, isn't it? That, that just blows my mind. Um, I mean, it's kind of simplistic, but it makes sense prophetically from what we're reading in Revelation 17 and Revelation 13. Samuel Huntington writes this in terms of his world peace formula. He said, world politics is entering a new phase. And remember, he wrote this in 1983, in which the great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of international conflict will be cultural 
Civilizations, the highest cultural groupings of people are differentiated from each other by religion, history, language, and tradition. These divisions are deep and increasing in importance. From Yugoslavia to the Middle East to Central Asia, the fault lines of civilizations are the battle lines of the future. In this emerging era of cultural conflict, the United States must forge alliances with similar cultures and spread its values wherever possible. With alien civilizations, the West must be accommodating if possible, but confrontational if necessary. We clearly see that in the Middle East. In the final analysis, however, all civilizations will have to learn to what? Tolerate each other. Okay, well, the, 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 I, I thought of something just a, a second ago and I, I, I just lost it and it was important, but I probably should drink some water. Um, it does happen. It's what happens to type two diabetics. So don't ever become like me. Just do, do what I tell you. Just don't do as I do, right? At least that's what they teach you in New York City. They always have such smart mouths on them out there. I, I always said to my, my friends in New York, I always used to say, you know, you guys shoot from the mouth. We cowboys from the West Coast, you know, we're slow talking. You know, we don't bother listening to talk. We just shoot from the hip. We don't ask any questions. We just, we shoot, we shoot and ask questions later. So anyway. Don't, don't misunderstand me there. It's just a joke. Um, so Sammy Huntington goes on. He says, um, maybe I'll remember it as we go along here. Um, for the first time since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948, countries not thoroughly steeped in the Judeo-Christian and natural law traditions are emerging to challenge the global supremacy of the United States, i.e. Islam, okay, and China. That unprecedented situation will define the new international politics of human rights. It will also multiply the occasions for conflict. Huntington goes on to describe how that many nations in the so-called new clash period do not believe the United, the United Nations can uphold and enforce the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. That few nations take it seriously anymore and that the only means of achieving world peace is to take a step backward toward mere tolerance instead of universal guarantees enforced by the United Nations Security Council or by the United States unilaterally through the recommendations of the U.S. State Department and since Huntington's thesis in 1996, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, of which they just elected their ambassador, uh, former Governor Sam Brown Brownback, just this last week uh, by the U.S. Senate. If you followed that news piece, you may not have. I did. Um, okay, now I know, I remember what I was gonna say. Tim Rusenberg, my colleague, uh, puts together a, a series uh, he started in our prophecy camp meetings that we had down in Eugene back in 2007, 2008, and 2009, where he introduced his clash of civilizations or Christianity and Islam seminars. And, he tends to focus more on Armageddon and this clash between Islam and Christianity. I, as a contrast, and I've, I've, I've tried to be helpful, not that I'm right, but I believe that the world peace threat to religious freedom is really what's at stake here, that we, we see the world, instead of a clash, that this clash will, will um, continually call will be called upon by world leaders to sue for world peace. In other words, I, I think that religious unity and political unity is what comes out of it um, in a very detrimental, detrimental prophetic way. Um, and we often don't look at the ecumenical or interfaith movements as the great prophetic sleeper movements, as I call them. We don't pay attention to this stuff at all. And it's something that I believe is vitally important to understand in terms of our prophetic message, but I don't believe we do. I shared this with Ted Wilson just at our Eighth World Congress on Religious Freedom and Human Rights, where the emphasis was on the doctrine of peaceful coexistence with many other world faith leaders there and diplomats and so forth. And we had our banquet with some of these leaders that night and my table was just off, off from Ted Wilson's and I asked Ted if he could, if he had a few minutes to talk. And at the end of the banquet afterwards, uh, we talked and I shared with him basically in a nutshell in five minutes, my whole thesis I'm sharing with you now. 
And he said, you know, he says, I've often wondered about that. He says, you know, I, I, I agree with you. He says, but we're trying to present it in a way that is hopeful while realizing it's never going to happen. I said, well, but that doesn't make it authentic, does it? He says, no, that's true, but it's our way of, of tapping into the interfaith community and the ecumenical movement. And I said, I agree. I says, There's, I'm all for that. I, I do that myself. I says, I'm a, I'm a member of the Interfaith Council of Greater Portland. I says, I know what you're talking about. I, I totally understand. We find ourselves in the midst of uh, participating, but not bending to it or compromising. And all the while keeping our prophetic head on our shoulders, so to speak. And in our, in our understanding of things. And so, um, but he recognized that really this whole doctrine of peaceful coexistence plays into the hands of restricting our religious freedom, especially to evangelize worldwide. What is the number one thing we do as a church worldwide? It's evangelism. Don't kid yourself. More money is spent on evangelism than anything else. Now, I'm for new methods of evangelism, mind you. But I think that evangelism, at least public evangelism, the way we've done it, has its place. Now, can you imagine, now that I've presented you this, can you imagine in the name of world peace, can you imagine evangelism being a legally punishable offense on a global scale and mere religious tolerance, the new internationally enforced norm? Can you imagine that? There is a law being passed in India right now restricting any form of evangelism. Um, follow it. I've been following it, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Mr. Moda is bound and determined to do that. Um, the example I've already given you, in the West, in democratic societies, to evangelize, witness, and proselytize means to share freely in the free marketplace of ideas. Respectful competition is good and healthy, at least that's the way we view it, right? Okay, that's why the Seventh-day Adventist Church, through Liberty Magazine, through the Northwest Religious Liberty Association, goes out of our way to defend all people of faith, defend all people's religious freedoms, okay? Not just our own. That's what our mission, that's what our ministry is all about. That's why we're very active in the ecumenical and interfaith spheres, okay? That's why we were able, the Northwest Religious Liberty Association was able to spend 10 years initiating the Oregon Workplace Religious Freedom Act and then bringing all the religious leaders of the state together, Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Catholics, Baptists, um, Quakers, Adventists, Mormons, etc. And it resulted in a landmark piece of legislation. Um, so in East, in non-democratic societies, to proselytize, witness, or evangelize means to coerce. Competition is forcefully discouraged, especially in socialistic and communistic countries. Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says the following. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public and private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practices, worship, and observance. Okay? So, do you see any room for just mere tolerance there? Do you see any room for the doctrine of peaceful coexistence? Well, you should be aware, and I'll share this with you in a minute, but I subscribe to the Review of Faith and International Affairs. Um, the most recent issue is on Popes on the Rise, the Modern Papacy and World Affairs. These, this is written, these articles are written by some of the leading foreign policy scholars in the world. No, they're not Adventists. And this particular issue, Religious Freedom and the Study and Practice of U.S. Foreign Policy. Anyway, there's an article in here by international law scholar Brett Sharps from Brigham Young University in Utah called International Law and the Defamation of Religion Conundrum. I know that's a mouthful. But... In the article, he points out the history of what's been happening at the United Nations, especially the Human Rights uh, Council and also the General Assembly. And I don't know if you've been aware, but the 57 Muslim nation called the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or the OIC, has been trying to amend Articles 18 and 19, which is the free speech Clause. What happened? I guess we're going backwards here. Hmm. Having to punch this twice to get one. 
The free speech uh, clause says everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. Um, from 2009 through 2011, there was an attempt by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, 57 nations coming together to amend Articles 18 and 19 to include blasphemy law language. In other words, the uh, outlawing any form of evangelization or proselytization in the world. Any nation could punish you, uh, in other words, be free to punish you uh, for evangelizing in their country. And um, here's the vote tallies. You ready for this? Human Rights Council. Um, 23 voted in favor, only 11 opposed, and 13 abstentions, so it didn't pass. It needed two-thirds to pass. Uh, in 2010, in the General Assembly, 76 nations voted in favor, 64 against, and 42 abstentions. Um, and I know you're not going to like what I'm about to say, and that's fine. I don't, I don't care. Um, and I don't mean to be crass about that. But um, in 2011, the Secretary of State at that time, U.S. Secretary of State, was Hillary Clinton. And she's the one that brought all these nations together to vote unanimously against these new proposals by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. She came up with what's called Resolution 1618, which shifted away from the controversial idea of defamation of religion to focus more narrowly on combating religious intolerance. That is, they all agreed unanimously at the United Nations to condemn the um, desecration of, of images uh, or the uh, cartoons of Muhammad or, or anything like that in newspapers or magazines or any defamation by name of Muhammad uh, through videos or etc. And also the condemnation of defamation of crucifixes, images of Christ, and so on. So that's what the world body voted on in Resolution 1618 at the United Nations Human Rights Council. So I thought that was fascinating that at one point we almost lost our ability to evangelize worldwide as a church. We almost lost it. And there's been threats since. The OIC has not stopped. John Kerry, Secretary of State, fought it off. I don't know what Rex Tillerson is doing. I haven't read anything printed by the Review of Faith and International Affairs uh, to know if they know what's going on. Um, the organization, it's printed by the Center on Faith and International Affairs uh, for the Institute uh, for Global Engagement. And uh, Chris Seipel, my good friend, lives up in Seattle. He's the one that heads up this organization. Uh, Robert Seipel um, uh, has very, been very much involved in our International Religious Liberty Association at the General Conference, both Baptists um, and very helpful to our cause to advance religious freedom. Uh, Senator, I mean, Secretary of State back during the Obama administration um, in his International Religious Freedom Report said there was a rapid increase of blasphemy and apostasy laws around the world. And that was a big concern. Um, and this is interesting too. In 2007, something very fascinating happened for the first time in, in world history. Um, on November 7, 2007, the Saudi monarch Abdullah, King Abdullah, met with a sitting pope, Pope Benedict XVI. And the reason why this meeting was significant was because Saudi Arabia pretended to be the champion of human rights. Now, what does Saudi Arabia know about human rights? Right? In fact, um, his plea to the Pope, the Pope's plea was that his, his request that Saudi Arabia follow through on something was, remember, this is a power meeting, so this is not going to be a waste of time, right? So the Pope pled with the king to allow its Catholic peoples in Saudi Arabia to meet in their home churches. They were constantly being jailed. Most of the Catholics that are in Saudi Arabia are Filipino migrant workers who build most of their houses over there in Saudi Arabia. They're construction workers, okay, builders, contractors, etc. All right, and so they meet in homes and are often arrested. So he said, "Okay, we'll back off on that. We won't do that anymore." And um, that's the only thing the Pope asked for. Um, but Benedict, I mean, uh, uh, King Abdullah asked that. Uh, 
on their end, um, said that we want, we want you to help us to secure a seat on the Human Rights Council, which the Pope did. And not only helped them, but also helped Cuba have a seat on the Human Rights Council. What does Cuba know about human rights? Nada. Okay. Um, and to also um, allow them to conduct a, um, a big worldwide um, anti-defamation conference or human rights conference in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, which they did. And, oh, the other demand that the Pope had was to be able to build uh, two cathedrals, one in Jeddah and one in Riyadh, two Catholic cathedrals, first in Saudi Arabian history. And indeed, they have been built. Um, the third thing was that, the, that he enlisted the Pope's backing to support the Organization of Islamic Cooperation to amend Articles 18 and 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to basically outlaw evangelism worldwide as we know it today. Okay? Benedict would not do that. Okay? So you can thank Pope Benedict XVI for sticking to Western values. However, I have an announcement to make. Pope Francis I does not hold to those values, okay, is ready to give them away, all right? Well, that's coming up. Just hold on. We've already gone through this. Um, and, and one person who I wrote two articles about in Liberty Magazine, and they were delivered to the White House, both of them, was I was rather critical of President Obama. Um, and I liked President Obama a lot, but I thought he was rather naive when it came to international religious freedom policy. He, in these two articles in Liberty Magazine, I pointed out uh, the problems. I also pointed out the tensions between him and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton uh, rejecting his view of international religious freedom policy and uh, uh, calling him naive and everything else. They, they clashed like crazy uh, in the White House. They didn't like each other. And because here, while Hillary Clinton at the United Nations was trying to basically stop the OIC from eviscerating and outlawing evangelism, Obama, in his speeches, was naively promoting this doctrine of peaceful coexistence. In his, um, his first speech was in, um, and I documented here in uh, an Olive Branch Doctrine. Uh, it's the cover lead story in Liberty. Uh, this was back in 2011. Um, I point out that his first speech was in Turkey before the parliament, and he put forward this doctrine of peaceful coexistence, and he went to Egypt. He did the same thing um, at al Azhar University. And then, that was in 2009, and then in 2010, he went to Jakarta, Indonesia, where he spent six years of his childhood, um, and he praised the new, in, uh, the new constitu constitution of Indonesia which is known as Pancasila. Pancasila is a five um, foundation pillared constitution, which simply, mean, which simply emphasizes the doctrine of peaceful coexistence. That is, you have a right to peaceful coexist, but you don't have a right to um, share your faith. And so he uh, uh, championed their view of tolerance and didn't use the word collective censorship, but I've already described the doctrine of collective censorship, which is the idea that if all of you represented the world, religious leaders in the world, and you raise your hand to share your faith, if one of the people in that room objected, you would not be able to share your faith. That's a form of collective censorship. And so he championed that in his speech, and I have the transcript of it. Uh, it's amazing. He backpedals on it um, a couple years later at a speech at the UN General Assembly on September 25, 2012. Totally backpedals, totally unravels everything he said in all three of those speeches in Turkey, Egypt, and uh, Indonesia. He walks it all back. You could see Hillary Clinton's influence all the way through it because the very language of Revolution 1618 at the United Nations, which Hillary Clinton passed, was in his speech. So it was fascinating uh, to watch this genesis of how close we came to the brink of losing religious freedom and evangelization, the ability to evangelize uh, worldwide at one point while we were sleeping. 
Um, in September 27, 2012, that same year, something also extraordinary happened. Pope Benedict XVI, um, this was going to be his last international visit, but no, nobody knew it. No, ha nobody had a clue the bombshell that was going to come once he got back to Rome, announcing his retirement. But as he was in the air flying to Lebanon from Rome, he got news that this video had been released in Los Angeles called The Innocence of Muslims, a YouTube film uh, mocking the Prophet Muhammad in the Benghazi aftermath in Libya. And as soon as he gets off the plane, Maronite Patriarch Becker Rai of Lebanon urged Benedict XVI to reverse the Vatican's policy of opposing, amending the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to include anti-defamation language. And his response was, according to the Religion News Service, was that we'll go back and look at it. Well, that was washing his hands. All right, he would go back to Rome, announce his retirement, and who would emerge? Pope Francis I. Pope Francis I, on a trip, another significant event, when millions had come out to see him in the Philippines in uh, 2015, the Charlie Hebdo massacre occurred. How many of you remember what Charlie Hebdo was? The French magazine, okay? Two uh, ISIS gunmen, terrorists came in and shot everybody up, okay? Total massacre of the magazine. The magazine that was producing and printing, um, publishing uh, cartoons mocking Muhammad, okay? And the Pope and everybody else in the sun. It was just a, it, it's a... Um, um, sacrilegious, uh, uh, unholy, paganistic magazine that sought to make fun of everybody. Um, but the Pope in Crux Magazine, which is a crux.com, it's an affiliate of Boston Globe newspaper. Um, I know St. Martin, San Martin wrote this article he, on, um, I forget the name of the article, but I have the piece um, in my pile of stories here. The Pope says Christian unity and thus world peace means rejecting proselytism and competition. That's Pope Francis I. It seems that he has given breath and life to the interfaith movement to basically restrict evangelism or proselytization as we know it. Okay, for the first time. And I, I find that fascinating because it's a trend that we have to keep watching. Um... Is there a world peace threat to religious freedom in closing? Anti-defamation, is it a potential push button issue in order to unite Muslims and Christians to sue for world peace? Think about that. I leave you with that thought. Then Revelation 13, 13, the fire from heaven includes the growing alliance of charismatic Protestants in the US with Rome and the world's masses turning to the world's spiritual leaders particularly Rome, over political leaders to bring about world peace? Is that what's going on? Hey, friends, I don't have all the answers, but I just want you to keep your eyes and ears open. And I believe this is the greatest threat. Um, and it's while we're sleeping. And I believe it's not a clash of... A big Armageddon with explosions going. Those will always happen. There's wars and rumors of wars, we're told in Matthew 24. But no, when, when, when a grand bargain is made by world leaders to extinguish groups of people because they resist, they stand in defiance um, against those who would restrict their religious freedom and their consciences, especially the right to freely share their faith anywhere in the world, which is what Articles 18 and 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights protect. It's what the First Amendment protects. My friends, um, there's an international threat that we're, we're not aware of, we're not keeping track of, and I just thought I'd share that with you so that you would know what's going on at that level. Um, if you want me to come back in the future, Teddy, uh, I have another seminar on... Um, Besides the program I did on the upper room, the uh, clash of kingdoms, love, power, and betrayal in the upper room, um, I have another presentation on uh, America's Christian nation debate. What were the constitutional founders' original intent regarding the constitutional separation of church and state? So, anyway, let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, 
This is a, a long presentation, and, and uh, I know that it's hard to comprehend everything I've stated, but I pray that you would bless each one here, that you would help us to not only be discerning, but to be Christ-like in everything we do. And the most of all, regardless of what knowledge we have or think we have, help us to be kind to one another. Help us to be kind to everyone. Help us to be loving and kind. Lord, that's the biggest witness of all. It doesn't matter how much we know. It's how loving we are to others. Lord, I just pray that we would um, take on your example. And like in the upper room, help us to recognize you as both the servant and master. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, I have some business cards up here. If anybody wants my business card, you're free to come and have one. Yes? Sure. Yeah, John. It's John, right? Jim. Jim, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so we just moved here from Kennewick, as you may know. Yeah, I'm <laughs> thrilled that you're here. Anyway, so we were religious liberty there for years. Yeah, I, thank you. I greatly love religious liberty. I do have one question that's troubled me for years. Yep. So we believe in religious liberty. It's a fundamental tenet, really, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yes. Now, how does that relate to a group who believes we should not have liberty. How, let me use an extreme example. Suppose there was a group that believed Christians should be killed. Mm -hmm. Should that religion be given liberty to proselytize and expand in this country? Well, okay, that's, that's really not hard to answer. The Supreme Court has made it very clear there's a belief conduct distinction. So in other words, um, in, in, in when it comes to constitutional law, there's a belief conduct, belief slash conduct distinction. It's a fundamental thing. You can say to Johnny, your brother, um, I'm going to kill you, but not mean it. You know what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, kids do it all the time. They say it all the time, and it's stupid, but we've all done it, okay? So, or if they believe in, let's say, the, the doctrine of Dar al-Islam, which, if you study out Islam, clearly says that their goal is to conquer the world in, be, in, in behalf of Allah. Okay, well, it's actually no different than the belief of Christians who believe, whether it's Tim LaHaye, Pat Robertson, uh, uh, um, Hal Lindsey, the great, late, late great planet Earth, their, their goal is to uh, basically uh, anybody who does not uh, go by Christian norms and Christian terms uh, must be destroyed in the name of world peace. Okay, there's those, ex there's those extremes on the Christian side as well. So just because they exist doesn't mean that, that they should be outlawed. You see, so it would affect both sides if you're going to treat them equally. But if you're only going to um, target one group, then there's a problem. So that's why you don't target any. Now, if they're actively carrying out killings, all right, then we have a rule of law. It's called civil law. It's called uh, we take them to a court of justice and we try them and we execute them or jail them for life. That's the simple answer. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I've got a, a question. Have you uh, seen Ron Reagan's ad on TV? Who's? Ron Reagan. Oh, oh yeah, his, his, his ad for atheism. Yeah, that's been on for about five years. Yeah. yeah. What do you, what's your spin on that? Um, you know, let me... Ron Reagan, the son of Ronald Reagan, um, along with Nancy Reagan, who uh, is a charter member and backer of it, um, is the champion of atheism values. And it's, uh, but they also subscribe to the constitutional separation of church state. Obviously not the same. Their view of, of, of religious freedom is 
their view of it is to be free from religion. In other words, they want a society free from religion. So they're, they're the head of the uh, free, Freedom of Religion, Freedom from Religion Foundation, I think is what it's called. And they're, they're um, suing uh, ben, Dr. Ben Carson right now for holding Bible studies in the, um, in the White House. Or no, at the... Uh, yeah, Department of Health and Human Services the, uh, building agency. And uh, acu they're being accused of, Dr. Carson's being accused of using government funds, um, of using government personnel, government staff, government cooks, et cetera, et cetera, to provide the bagels, the cinnamon rolls, the drinks, the whatever, beverages, when in fact none of that's true. Uh, it's all coming out of his money personal money. He pays for it himself. And so it's a false charge um, by the Freedom From Religion um, Foundation. Um, but that'll be borne out in court because obviously it's going to court. Uh, the judge will probably throw it out as a frivolous claim and probably not receive more in the day's hearing. Um, so I, yeah, it's nothing to be concerned about. He has every right to do what he's doing um, with his own money. Um, they have Bible studies by, um, and prayers by our own Senate chaplain, Barry Black, in, in Congress. Um, that's been done for years by many denominations. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't see what the problem is. Let me read something to you. I'll tell you what my belief is. It's our Northwest Religious Liberty Association philosophy statement. It's fairly short, and it's in, it was published in the Gleaner last May. In my right next to my article, right next to my article on uh, warning about the repeal of the Johnson Amendment by Congress and by President Trump. Um, just a second. It's very important you hear this because if you don't, then you won't understand the balance that we bring in understanding. Um, Okay, there we go, here we go. Oh, I have it in just a second here. I get frustrated with computers, but man, what will we do without them? Um, these smartphones are just amazing. I'm sold. I've been conquered. Um, okay. I believe in freedom of religion, but not the freedom to enforce religion, particularly acts of worship, nor the freedom to purge society of religion. This means upholding both the establishment and free exercise clauses of the First Amendment to a high constitutional standard against powerful forces. Using this standard, government neutrality means religion and religious institutions must be allowed to thrive freely, but without its official endorsement. The First Amendment in part states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Today, some seek to reinterpret the no establishment provision separating church and state in ways that would require government to financially support their institutions and enforce their dogmas so as to solve the moral ills of the nation. Others seek to marginalize the free exercise of religion by failing to recognize that government must have a sufficient compelling interest when lawfully denying or restricting the constitutional right of individuals and institutions of faith to exercise and maintain their religious mission and practices. Both are harmful to our constitutional health. We believe the nation's founders anticipated this tension. That is why they created an internal check and balance within the very wording of the First Amendment in order to prevent the country from being overrun by either extreme in the great church-state debate, a puritanical versus godless society. Remove this balancing safeguard and our nation's constitutional guarantees will be lost, and with it our civil and religious freedoms. Sandra Day O'Connor, who I did my dissertation on, retired Supreme Court Justice, summed it up best. The religious zealot and the theocrat frighten us in part because we understand only too well their basic impulse. No less frightening is the totalitarian atheist who aspires to a society in which the exercise of religion has no place. Okay. Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, sure. You wanted that note? Yeah. Okay. 
No problem. Oh, man. Oh, now we got to go forward a lot. This battery in this must be low. There we go. I'm still trying to get that in my head. Sure. Well, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's the, it's the fundamental explanation. It helps you to picture the whole thing. Good. Glad that's helpful. I actually learned that when I was in Romania. It was fascinating to me. Greg? Yeah, A Teddy. couple of quick questions, I think. Mm -hmm. One is, uh, we didn't see that video on Rick Warren. Could you just... In, yeah, the Rick Warren video, which, which I have that? always been able to see in every church. And I'm maybe sorry. remind people who Rick Warren is and... Yeah, Rick yeah. Warren is... Um, I forget the name of his church. Um, Camelback. Camelback, thank you. Down in Southern California. And uh, one of the most influential um, Protestant pastors in the United States. And it's a video where he says that there's no difference between the Catholic faith and Protestants in terms of what we believe. He says, he says, he says when it comes to the main core values, we agree on everything. And um, which I found is fascinating. He says, oh yeah, but sure, there's some uh, doctrines we don't agree with, but pretty much on the big values, the big things, we agree fully. And so we don't worry about the small stuff, um, which I thought was fascinating. Um, but in fact, essentially, when you look at Vatican II and where the Catholic Church has been going, um, it's more and more trying to appear just like Protestants, and especially Pentecostal Protestants and the charismatic movement. Um, and in it, he says that basically we're united on three things. And he says, these are the things that always unite us. And these are the things we must always stay united on in order to bring about world peace and change. He says, the sacredness of life, the sacredness of family. And I forget the third one. Um, which is, you know, very much in protecting the family against same-sex marriage. And, of course, the doctrine of life, which is very pro-life and anti-abortion. And then the third, uh, forgot what it was, but essentially there was, essentially there was three things. And he outlines it really well. And then he says that the church um, is growing in Latin America. The church is growing in South America. The church is growing in China. The church is growing in India. The church is growing in Indonesia. The church is growing in Russia. The church is growing in Eastern Europe, but it's not growing in Europe and the United States. Okay? And he said that the international world is basically um, shaping how, you know, the next movements will be which is the unity on those three sacred things in his mind that brings Christianity together that will choke out any threat to it and that Christianity will emerge victorious over anything pagan or anything that assaults Christian values, which I thought was fascinating. It's a two minute clip. It's like two minutes and 20 seconds. It's very powerful. I'm sorry you couldn't see it. I show it at every one of these talks that I give to show the unity that's coming in the ecumenical world as opposed to the interfaith world. So to show the, how the two are come together uh, and find common cause through the charismatic movement, bringing them both together, bringing both the left and the right together. Um, the divides we see today were the divides that is, existed in Israel during the time of Christ. You know, Sadducees versus Pharisees, and they're two different worldviews. I mean, Sadducees were essentially atheists. They didn't believe in afterlife, and they didn't believe in angels, and they didn't believe in miracles. So Pharisees believed in all the good things you and I believe in. I mean, they were good Puritans. You know, they were, they were like Paul, you know. Paul, I mean, Paul talks about himself being a good Pharisee, you know. Um, but they thought they could work their way to heaven by their good works, so... Um, and they definitely wanted to get rid of Rome. So there was political divergences, clashes, and also religious values, clashes between the two groups. And yet they both sat in the Sanhedrin, which is fascinating. But they both united for a common cause, crucifixion of Christ. 
So remember that analogy. Yes. It's a historical analogy that we must never forget. Mm. And one other question, you, you referenced another program that you do about myth of the Christian nation. What in a nutshell, when somebody comes up to one of us and says, hey, this is a Christian nation, what are you talking about? Yeah, that's easy. Um, well, it is. We're, we're, it's true, and, and I have this in one of my presentations. Um, when somebody says we're a Christian nation, uh, they're right in three areas, okay? The uh, Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, um, Gallup, this was in uh, 1990, and also later Baylor University survey, um, and also a Newsweek survey. Um, and each survey kept demonstrating how um, Christianity um, has uh, lost adherence in terms of those who profess in it anymore. So like in 1990, the first survey said that 92% um, of all Americans uh, profess to be a Christian at one level or another. In other words, from your highest fundamental level down to your lowest, even secular humanist level of, of uh, belief, whether that's um, agnosticism, deism, um, secular humanism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, nominal Christianity, essentially, um, like what William Miller was, essentially, um, or Benjamin Franklin, or Thomas Jefferson, or James Madison, or George Washington. You understand what I'm saying, okay? So that was in 1990, but then the Baylor survey and the Pew uh, survey came along, and it was reduced down to 75%, a drop of 17%, okay, in 1995. And then recently Newsweek has come along and it, it, was, it was backed up by a Baylor University study out of the very sociology of religion course that, that Philip Jenkins teaches at Baylor, which is where the survey came from, um, said that uh, 70 to, only 72% of Americans profess to be Christian in one form or another. So um, yes, we're, what, what it proves is this, we're a Christian nation demographically we're a Christian nation in terms of our predominant values, okay? Um, Protestant work ethic, um, certain cultural values that we adhere to, okay? Um, civil rights and religious freedom for all, okay? Those fundamental values, all right? But we are not a Christian nation legally or constitutionally. And that's the difference. You have to make that distinction. If we were a Christian nation uh, legally and constitutionally, we would be no different than Muslim nations who operate off of Sharia law. Do we want to be a Christian nation by law? I don't. Do you want to be like the Puritans of old? No, I don't. The constitutional founders didn't. They ran like blank away from the Puritan founding for that very reason. But a lot, of, a lot of your evangelicals, like David Barton with his videos and other people, they come along and they blur the Puritan founding with the constitutional founding and the constitutional founders as if they're one and the same. They're not. And, and to be honest with you, I, we just published a book that dispels all that. Um, and I announced it this morning. Um, and that's the reason why our department published it. We just published 10,000 copies. We had a $50,000 donation. It just got off the ship from China, but it's now at Advent Source in um, uh, Nebraska. And uh, it's going to be available at your ABCs um, in March and also on Amazon.com. And we're giving it as a gift to each um, state legislator every time a new one comes in. And it also uh, puts forward our achievements as what we've done organizationally. This is the Oregon Workplace Religious Freedom Act and the signing by Governor Ted Kulingoski in 2010. It took us 10 years to pass that. But it basically starts out with an essay. It's called Soul Liberty, Celebrating America's First Freedom, authored by yours truly. And it goes, takes you from the days of the Puritans, Roger Williams, um, clear to um, our nation's constitutional founding, 
and it's a coffee table book, so even children, it's, it's very simply done um, so that they can understand it. And of course, we introduce our Declaration of Principles, including the philosophy statement I just read for you from here is in here. And, uh, and then we have the full text of the Declaration of Independence with founding fathers, pictures and statements laced throughout regarding religious freedom. Um, this is the Declaration of Independence. And then there's the surrender at Yorktown um, to the British, I mean, uh, the British to the Americans. This is the rotunda inside Congress. This is the constitutional, this is the document of the Constitution here. So we go through the Constitution. And then I remind people of George Washington's uh, draft of the Tripoli, uh, Treaty of Tripoli, where he said, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. Okay, there you go. That was the treaty with Tripoli to Northern Muslim pirates. This is the Constitution. This is the Constitution Convention with Alexander Hamilton whispering into Benjamin Franklin's ear. There's George Washington, all the delegates, including Roger Sherman here from Connecticut. And then Benjamin Franklin's famous statement. When you assemble a number of men to have the advantage of their joint wisdom, you inevitably, inevitably assemble with those men all their prejudices, their passions, their errors of opinions, kind of, sort of like the upper room, you know, we were talking about. Their, their local interests and their selfish views. From such an assembly can a, perfect re, uh, can a perfect production be expected? It therefore astonishes me, sir, to find this system approaching to so, so near to perfection as it does. And uh, really does. This is something that, that our state legislators will love as a gift and they will not want to just throw it away. They'll keep it on their coffee table or put it in their bookshelf, one or the other. Here's Thomas Jefferson's famous statement on separation of church state. There's his memorial. There's, here's the amendments and they're showing burning around the edges, kind of like, you remember the old Bonanza show? on TV. Yeah, I did that on purpose because uh, our amendments, our freedoms are under threat. So especially the First Amendment. But Thomas Jefferson wrote, bear in mind the sacred principle that though the will of the majority is in all cases to prevail, that will to be rightful must be reasonable, that the minority possess their equal rights, which equal laws must protect. And to violate would be oppression. So some of these pictures I actually took myself years ago on my old little Canon power shot camera. You remember those? Yeah. I took this one of Lincoln. Um, here's the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, especially Articles 18 and 19, and a statement by Eleanor Roosevelt. This is this is really a, this is a statement that my secretary chose, Rhonda Bolton. Where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, and equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress progress in the larger world. So, and then of course, our organization and what we do, what our services are, there's our statement on philosophy with Benjamin Franklin there. Benjamin Franklin once said, I wrote, when a religion is good, I conceive that it will support itself. And when it cannot support itself and God does not take care to support so that its professors are obliged to call for the help of the civil power, it is a sign I apprehend of its being a bad one. Good wisdom there, huh? Anyway, so there's our philosophy statement, and then there's our legal services for help in the workplace. There's our legislative services. That's the rotunda of the Oregon legislature, which is my favorite. It's got that Indian view. Then we promote Liberty Magazine in the back, and then we have a statement of, of eight different things on ways you can help protect religious liberty. And then the old famous statement by John Hancock, I, I, I conjure you by all that is dear, by all that is honorable, by all that is sacred, not only that you pray, but that you act. I love that statement. And then James Madison's famous statement, which is perhaps my favorite, and I don't know why I put it in the back. It's actually in my essay um, at the front. 
Who does not see that the same authority which can establish Christianity in exclusion of all other religions may establish with the same ease any particular sect of Christians in exclusion of all others? So, and then of course I lead with my favorite character, my, my relative, Alexander Hamilton, at the very front. The, 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 the finished copy actually has the Constitution here with a candle and on the inside. But uh, this, is, this was just a Shutterfly copy of a sample of what we might get when the final product was done. But I thought I'd bring the copy, the, the sample, just with me um, instead of the real thing. So if it gets beat up, it gets beat up. Alexander Hamilton wrote, The sacred rights of mankind are not to be rummaged for among old parchments or musty records. They are written as with a sunbeam in the whole volume of human nature by the hand of the divinity itself. It can never be erased or obscured by mortal, mortal power. And then here's a table of contents. And then, then here's the introduction to what the book is about, Rediscovering America's Soul, Liberty of Conscience, and the Separation of Church and State. And then Jefferson's famous statement, which is on